Throughout the Mediterranean region and into Western Asia, there is a tree that grows. It stands about 30 feet tall. Its bark is smooth, white. It has large leaves with five lobes on each leaf. And from this tree grows a fruit, a tear-shaped fruit. The skin starts off green, and then as it ripens, turns into a dark purple. And within that skin is a red flesh that contains hundreds of crunchy seeds. This is the fig tree. The fig tree is a central image for our season of creation. It has been a sign of God's favor in several cultures, including in our Judeo-Christian heritage. The fig tree was one of seven harvests in the Middle East that could provide food all year round. And the fig is used several times in scripture, and we will encounter several of them this season to denote God's blessing, God's favor, God's abundance. Haggai, one of the shorter of the Old Testament prophets, not in stature, just in how much he wrote, prophesied in the early years after the Babylonian exile had ended. The second temple was in the process of being built, and it was a hard thing for many to witness. Because as stone was laid upon stone in this new temple, people would come and weep. And they wept not because they were joyful of the new temple, they wept because they remembered what was. They remembered Solomon's temple in all its glory, and this new temple was a poor imitation of the beauty of Solomon's great temple. Things were hard in those days. The land and the people were struggling. And Haggai, in the midst of that struggle, records a promise. Because that's so much what the prophets did. They recorded promises. Haggai records a promise that blessing will return. That things that had been fruitless, lifeless, would suddenly bear fruit because of God's blessing. Things might be hard. But because the people were faithful, things would start getting better. We skip ahead to John's gospel. And the first encounter between Jesus and the future disciple, Nathaniel. And it's a hard passage to hear because Nathaniel has some pretty hard words for Jesus at the outset. Because you see, again, things were difficult. First century Judea, things were hard. People who had waited for so long, who had worked so hard, were seeing no fruit for their efforts. And maybe you can hear frustration, or maybe you can hear exhaustion in Nathaniel's voice when he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? When things have been hard for a long time, it's hard to think things can get better. I think Jesus chooses his words very intentionally when Nathaniel asks how he knows him. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I just saw you sitting under that tree over there. No, Jesus very intentionally says, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. The fig tree which had been a sign of God's blessing, a, God, a sign of God's promise, a sign of God's abundance. I wonder if when Nathaniel heard that, he was reminded that things might be hard, but there is still hope to be found. 
So many, I, I feel like so many of the problems in our world today come because we have this certain mindset about how limited we are. We have been trained, not intentionally, but just through cultural osmosis, we have been trained to think of ourselves through our limitations, trained to think that we are the kind of people who don't have enough of something. And I think so many of the problems we face in the world today come about because we think of how limited we are. We see the collapse of the environment, the warming of the oceans, and we trace it back to this idea that we don't have enough. We don't have enough energy, so we've got to drill, baby, drill. We've got to extract and burn oil, coal, natural gas, because we don't have enough energy in our lives. We don't have enough building materials, so we have to tear down rainforests. We have to create these plastics that will never leave our world. So many of the problems we see in the environment stem from this idea that we do not have enough. Violence. So much of the violence we see in the world stems from this fear that we don't have enough or that we will lose what we do have. And if you think this is a modern problem, I'll tell you it isn't. Open your Bible's book of Genesis. First uh, big crisis, Cain and Abel. Cain thinks that he doesn't have enough of God's affection. And it leads to violence. How many acts of violence do we see in the world because of this fear of not having enough? Or that somebody else might have more than we do? Racism, there's a good theological and social argument that racism in our world today stems from a lack or a fear of scarcity fearing that we don't have enough rights to go around, fearing that if we offer somebody else equality, somehow that might take something from us. The economic divide in our world today, how much of that is caused by a fear of scarcity? That we have some members of our society that have accumulated so much wealth that they could not possibly spend it all within not only their lifetimes, but their children's, children's, children's lifetimes. How many of the deep problems in our world today stem from a fear of not having enough? But here's the thing, not a new fear. If you think this is a new fear to the 21st century, I've got stories to tell you. Because we human beings have always been afraid that we will not have enough. Go back to the story of Exodus, and we will see that God challenges this idea of scarcity over and over again. In Exodus, God's promise to God's people is abundance. When they were slaves in Egypt, the Israelites lived scarcity. They had a scarcity of rights, they were slaves. They had a scarcity of things. They had a scarcity of life. Their children were being killed. Life in Egypt was all about scarcity, yet here comes God promising a promised land. And how does God define the promised land? It is a land flowing with milk and honey. It is a place, God says, where fig trees grow. Life had been all about scarcity in Egypt. 
Yet God promises a place of abundance. And then let's just skip ahead to Jesus, because Jesus lives an abundant mindset. Everybody around him is focused on scarcity, on what they don't have. Jesus lives an abundant mindset. Jesus' first miracle, anybody remember what the first miracle is? Turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana? Scarcity mindset. Jesus, we're not going to have enough wine. So what does Jesus do? Jesus turns the water into the wine, and not just a little bit of wine. Jesus turns a lot of water into a lot of wine. Several years ago, I did the math, and you know, a good bottle of wine costs this much. I figured out how much wine Jesus made, and I calculated it was something like $70,000 worth of wine that Jesus creates. Jesus is not about scarcity. Jesus is about more than we could ever need. God, I hope that's more than we could ever need. And then how about those times when Jesus gathered people for eating, right? Jesus gathers with his disciples outside in his teaching, and the disciples say, Jesus, we have to send these people home because we have a scarcity of food. We don't have enough food to feed them. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says, how much you got? And they say, oh, we got some bread over here. We got some fish. We certainly don't have enough to go around. And Jesus says, try it anyways. And they find out not only do they have enough to go around, but they are collecting the leftovers afterwards. And Jesus doesn't do this once. He does this more than once because Jesus reminds us over and over again where we saw scarcity God sees abundance. And not just in the practical things like wine and bread. Think about just the concept of grace for a moment. That Jesus came into a world that had such a small, limited, scarce view of grace. That grace was for the deserving. Grace was for the perfect followers of the law. And here comes Jesus saying, not only is there enough grace to go around, but there is so much grace, you're not going to understand how much grace God has poured into your life. We need that mindset in the world today. We need that abundant mindset in our lives today. Nathaniel, the Disciple Nathaniel gives us a great look of someone who starts off in the story thinking so small. Thinking about the limitations. He thinks about it so much that he insults Jesus' hometown. Maybe you know somebody like that. Somebody who has spent so long struggling. Gone through disappointment after disappointment and has their hearts hardened to the possibility that things might change. Maybe you see a little bit of that in yourself. The fig tree. All the fruits that we're going to be sharing this season of creation are all reminders to us to stop thinking small to stop thinking about what we don't have. The fruits remind us, invite us to reframe our lives through a lens of abundance. Crossroads, a group that works in anti-racism training, talks about the difference between a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. They say the scarcity mindset always defaults to no. That whenever anything new comes up, whenever anything new is proposed, the automatic response of a scarcity mindset is no. We don't have enough. We can't risk losing what we've got. The abundance mindset, the default answer is yes. And then creates a space for transformation and innovation. I wonder 
if the prophet Haggai looked at fig trees differently. I wonder if after that prophecy where God says these fig trees that aren't bearing fruit are going to suddenly have fruit on them. I wonder if Haggai looked at the trees differently. I wonder if he switched from a scarcity mindset that said, no, those trees don't fruit anymore, to an abundance mindset that said, yes, anything's possible. I wonder if he looked at the trees differently. Or if I wonder when Nathaniel ate a fig, if they tasted differently. If after having Jesus associate him with this sign of abundance, I wonder if every time he ate a fig, maybe it tasted a little bit differently. Maybe it tasted a little bit like abundance. Take note of the places where you have adopted a scarcity mindset. Think of the places where you have said no to something that could have been amazing because you don't have enough of whatever it is because you think you don't have enough. Take note of the places where you have been fearful of losing something. Take note of fear that has kept you from really growing. I don't know what this is going to look like in everybody's life. It might look different, it almost certainly will look different for you than it does for me. But the moment we learn to start thinking abundantly rather than scarcely, our lives are going to change. So be on the lookout this season of creation. When you come to church and you see the fruit in your bulletin, or when you see it on our starting to fruit tree up here, remind yourself that we are living in a world of abundance, that ours is a God of abundance, that scarcity holds us back, that fear keeps us from living, and that when we embrace abundant living, all things are going to change. God can do some pretty amazing things with abundant people. Let's pray together. Lord God, remind us of the fig tree. Remind us of the fruit that comes not once but twice, that feeds not for a season but for a year. Remind us of the fruit that you have shown to us, the fruit of our lives that will change the world. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.